Okay, good morning. Let's get started. Any questions? Any questions? Questions? Okay, so I have uh, a few examples today. Basically, uh, what we have covered in this first half of the course includes Gauss's law, Coulomb's law, capacitance, resistance. So I have a collection of some questions and some conceptual questions, pretty much like what you saw in the quizzes, uh, in the lab quiz, more on the conceptual side. Uh, so first of all, I have uh, this example of a capacitor or a resistor, whichever way you want to see it. So it is a rectangular slab that I have bent. And uh, now I, uh, it, uh, I have connected it to the voltage source. So the potential, I'm being told, depends only on the phi coordinate. Only on the phi coordinate. And uh, it has boundary values at uh, phi equals 0, which is the x-axis. So phi equals 0 is right here. equal to uh, 0, and phi at pi over 2 equals to V0. So it has been connected to this uh, voltage source. Uh, you see that there are these electrodes, and these electrodes have uh, a thickness equal to H on this side. So this is H. And uh, this whole thing has been uh, made out of a cylindrical shell. So the inner radius is A, and the outer radius is B. So the cross-section of uh, this uh, resistor or capacitor is uh, on the XY plane looks like this. I think it would help if you see it on the cross-section. So that is the cross-section. And you have A here, B there. And this material in between has dielectric permittivity epsilon and conductivity. So it is a lossy dielectric. It is a lossy dielectric. So we will have some resistance. And we're being asked to find the capacitance and the uh, resistance here. Find R and C. So I will find uh, C first. Uh, you remember when you have capacitance, capacitance is, so I start with a capacitor and I remind you that C is charge over voltage. So we have two uh, options, set the voltage, find the charge, or set the, charge, uh, uh, set the uh, charge, find the electric field, from the electric field find the voltage, and then the, find the capacitance as Q over V. Here the voltage has been already set, so therefore I will go uh, down the uh, first path. So you see the voltage between the electrodes has been set. So my, um, my goal will be to find the charge. So you see this is a, a, a capacitor. It may look like a strange capacitor to you, but it is pretty much like the parallel plate capacitor that we have bent. And now it uh, occupies an arc. So there will be some charge plus Q here and some charge minus Q here. So that will be, uh, that is the charge that I need to find. To find the charge, I need to find the electric field. To find the electric field, having the voltage, I can just use the Poisson or the Laplace equation. And there have been many questions uh, still uh, on, uh, in Piazza. Oh, there seems to be noise from next door. OK. Um, uh, questions, when do I use the one or the other? Remember that, uh, so here, since I have, I know that V is a function of phi, and uh, I have boundary values. I use the Poisson or Laplace equation to find um, V everywhere. And then from V, I will find the electric field as minus gradient of V. 
Now, remember that uh, the Poisson equation uh, generally is minus divergence of epsilon gradient of V equals to volume charge density. And that reduces to the Laplace equation when epsilon is constant and rho V is zero. So if epsilon is constant, it drops out of the equation uh, and rho V uh, out of uh, the differential operator, the divergence. And if rho V is zero, then you have zero on the right hand side. And then uh, this reduces to the Laplace equation, which is that Laplacian of V is zero. So there shouldn't be any confusion. This is in the age sheet. Uh, you will see it there as uh, minus V equals rho sub V. So when rho sub V is zero, you have only the right, the left part. When epsilon is constant, the epsilon drops out and you have just uh, the Laplacian applied directly to V. So then if we go and um, solve this uh, Laplacian of V is zero, we have d square of V by d phi squared is zero because um, here we have been told that the potential depends only on phi. So therefore, I go to the H sheet, I see d over dr, d over dz, all these will go to zero. All these will go to zero. And therefore, this reduces only to d squared uh, v over d phi squared. I integrate once. I have uh, that dv over d phi has to be equal to a constant. I integrate twice. V is equal to C1 phi plus C2. And I have the boundary conditions. Uh, at phi, phi equals 0, V has to be 0. But at phi equals 0, uh, V is equal to the second constant. So the second constant is equal to 0. At phi equal pi over 2, the voltage is equal to V0. Uh, so C1 times pi over 2 should be equal to V0. So C1 is 2 V0 over pi. And that means that I have the potential. My potential is 2 V0 over pi times phi. So you see when phi is 0, V is 0. When phi is pi over 2, V is V0. So it satisfies the boundary conditions. This is the potential. And now that I have the potential, I can find the electric field as minus gradient of V. Again, the gradient, if you look at the H sheet, has three terms. However, here, my V depends only on phi. So only the d by d phi is active in there. All the other ones are 0. So the one relevant term will be uh, minus uh, phi hat uh, 1 over r dv over dv over d phi. And that will give you minus phi hat 1 over r. Uh, dv over d phi is, you see, v is linear, so it is 2 v naught over pi. So you see now that the electric field points in the minus phi direction. So the phi uh, directions, uh, the phi direction, the phi uh, vector uh, goes from phi points from uh, phi equal 0 to phi equal pi over 2. So it points in this direction. The electric field points in the opposite direction. So the electric field looks like this. Do I expect this or not? Yes, because the electric field always points in the direction of decreasing potential. So therefore, this uh, makes sense. So now I go and find Q from uh, the electric field. D will be the electric flux density epsilon times E. So it points in exactly the same direction. It's minus phi hat 2 epsilon V naught by pi r. So then I will go and apply boundary conditions to find rho sub s in any of the two electrodes. So these two are the electrodes that 
we have in this capacitor. So I pick the top electrode so that I uh, find plus Q. So I have here a conductor. And uh, I define a normal vector to the conductor. That will be the minus phi hat unit vector. The phi hat unit vector here points in this direction, actually points in the minus x direction. Uh, if you remember, uh, the phi hat unit vector in Cartesian coordinates is minus x sine phi plus y cosine phi. So at phi equals pi over 2, phi hat is minus x hat. Sine of 90 degrees is 1. Cosine of 90 degrees is 0. So it will be pointing the minus x direction at that electrode, at the top electrode. At the bottom electrode, phi is equal to 0. So you see that if you put here phi equals 0, sine is 0, cosine is 1. So it will be pointing in the x hat direction. That's why we're saying that whenever you have unit vectors that are not Cartesian, express them as Cartesian because many times we think of unit vectors as vectors that are constant in space. That's only true for x, y, z. So therefore, if uh, a unit vector is inside an integral like we have in, in uh, the Coulomb law cases, uh, then it has to be integrated because it changes over space. So. Um, in here, we have this n hat unit vector that points from the area of the conductor, from the electrode that is, which I call 1, to the area of the dielectric, which I call 2. The boundary condition there tells me that there will be a surface charge density, as I would expect, on the surface of the conductor. So on the electrode, there will be a surface charge density. Again, look at this as a bent version of the capacitor that we have seen many times. So there will be a charge there. And to find the charge, you need to find the surface charge density on the electrode. How do I do this? The boundary condition is n d2 minus d1 is equal to rho sub s. However, d1 is the uh, electric flux inside the conductor, which is 0. Inside the conductor, there is no flux. There is no field. There is no flux. All the charges on the conductor go to the surface. So this is 0. This n hat unit vector, as we said, is minus phi hat. This d2 is the d vector right here on the conductor. So that will be minus phi hat 2 epsilon v naught by pi r. So you see here, I have a surface charge density that changes. I think this is a difference with uh, respect to the parallel plate capacitor, where the surface charge density remains constant. Here, you see that the surface charge density depends on R. Depends on R. So phi dot phi with minus dot minus is 1. And I have a surface charge density that is 2 epsilon v naught by pi r. So that is the surface charge density in the electrode. It starts from 2 epsilon v naught by pi a in the inner, on the inner side of the electrode and becomes 2 epsilon v naught by pi b at the outer side of the electrode. So it just changes as you go uh, away. And now I can integrate this to find Q. So this surface charge density exists here in this electrode that uh, varies, as you see, from z equal 0 to z equal h and from r equals a to r equals b. So to find Q, I integrate rho s over the electrode. You see the electrode extends along z and r. So the ds here will be dr dz. So I just need to integrate r from, zero to, from a to b and z from 0 to h. So I do this and I have a bunch of constants here. I will take them out. 
and uh, a to b the r over r 0 to h of dz so this will give me h this will give me the logarithm of b over a and finally the capacitance will be this is a classical case where the capacitance just pops out you express the charge in terms of v naught so all you need to do here is divide out the voltage so q over v naught is the capacitance and it is equal to 2 epsilon ln b over a times h by pi so that uh, concludes the the capacitance calculation okay any questions up to this point yes please Yes. Yeah, you can do that. You can do that. I will just uh, show as well why this is why this works. Um, so your classmate is saying that since now I found R, I found C, and therefore and, and also the medium here is uniform, the, the permittivity and the conductivity do not change, then I can say that R C is equal to epsilon over sigma and directly find the resistance. So I expect uh, the resistance to be epsilon over sigma times the inverse of the capacitance, which is pi by 2 epsilon ln b over a h. So the epsilons cancel out. So the, the result that I expect is pi by 2 sigma ln b over a h. And you can put numbers there to attach to this a number, but I prefer to solve this symbolically so that um, you see the concepts. However, I'd like also to show how you would do this without invoking this formula, because you might want to start from R and go to C, let's say. So how else can I find it? What do I need? Resistance is voltage divided by current. Here I do have the voltage. Again, I have, it, I have said it already from before. So I need to find the current. And the current, as you see, flows through this cross section here. So the electric field gives rise, because of the conductivity, to a current density, J, which is sigma times E. So the electric field, again, it's over there. 1 over R, 2 sigma V naught over pi. So if I want to find the current, I need to integrate this current density over the cross-section through which the current flows. So this is a cross-section. It is very similar, this integration will be very similar to the integration we just saw. Now this ds will be pointing in the phi direction, in the minus phi direction again, and it will be dr dz. Again, if you go to your age sheet, differential surface elements, differential area elements, in cylindrical coordinates, because here we are working with cylindrical coordinates, you will see three of them. There is the one that points in the R direction, the Z direction, the phi direction. The current that we are trying to find will come from an integral of this form, J dot ds. That tells you that the ds you are looking for will have to point in the direction of the current, because your current is the flux that you are collecting from this j vector over this cross section. So if you are holding a z directed vector that is like this, you are not collecting any flux. The current flows parallel. It's like holding a bucket and the water passes by the bucket and nothing enters in there. So the z hat vector is not the one that you are looking for. If you run the dot product between phi hat and z hat, it will give you zero. If you run the dot product between phi hat and r hat, it will give you zero. So the only one that won't give you zero is 
the phi hat unit vector. So therefore, if you have no idea how I chose this vector, um, and you don't want to find out, okay, right now, uh, see it just how you game this process. You are running a dot product between the phi vector and some other vector. That dot product, evidently, here you have a current. The problem asks you for a resistance. So there is a current, it's not zero. So the only option is this one. And um, basically, the result, the integration will be very similar to the one we saw before. So j dot ds will be, again, I'm integrating on, on the cross section. This is my j, v naught over pi. It is in the minus phi hat direction. I go in and integrate in the direction of the current, dr dz. And I have, again, the same constants that pop out, 2 sigma v naught over pi. And I have dr over r from A to B, and dz from 0 to H. So that will give me 2 sigma v naught over pi ln b over A times H. And you may say I, it's exactly the same as before. Uh, however, previously, capacitance is Q over v naught. Now resistance is v naught over I. So we have to do the inverse. So this is I. I do V naught over I, and then I get uh, pi by 2 sigma ln B over A H, exactly like what you would, uh, you would expect from this uh, previous formula. OK, so this is uh, the, uh, this question. If I wanted to represent this, uh, just one question more. If I want to represent this as a circuit element, how would I represent it? So you see there is resistance, there is capacitance. Yes? We have like a resistance and capacitance connected in a parallel way. In parallel. So this is basically what you would call. So both of them, you can see it from the process that we calculated them, are subject to the same voltage. So therefore, they will have to be in parallel. So this is R, this is C. Um, yes, please. Are we given sigma or not? Like Sorry? We're assuming sigma is given. Yeah, it's, it was part of uh, the problem. Yes? I was kind of confused uh, the part where you do the normal vector. Can you uh, go, go through that processing idea and understand like, how you found uh, tan hat equals to pi minus? In here? Yeah. Um, so whenever I have a boundary, I have to, I write the boundary condition like this. I'm a little bit, uh, as you remember from the lectures, I did a little bit differently from the uh, textbook. I hope more clearly. Uh, so whenever I have a boundary, I divide the areas in one and two. And for me, the normal unit vector is the one that points from one to the second. And then that is the boundary condition. So. In this case, that is the phi hat unit vector. Or, as well, you can call it the, X, the plus x unit vector. So it is the same thing. It has to be normal. The electrode is right here, if you see it on the cross section. So it has to be in this direction. This is the x axis, this is the y axis. So it will have to point in the x hat direction, which happens to also be the minus phi hat, because you see, the, the phi hat unit vector starts here and then follows the trajectory of, a, of an arc that goes from the x-axis to the z-axis and ends up here. So on the y-axis, phi hat is minus x hat. You can see it also from here. If you put phi equal to uh, pi over 2, phi hat is minus x hat. You want to see it x hat and uh, this phi hat express it in uh, Cartesian coordinates, or the other way around, keep both in uh, cylindrical coordinates. And at the end of the day, again, if you don't understand this, okay, phi hat is what you need, 
right? And let's say you mess up the plus and you find minus. Then you go and ask yourself, I have connected the positive electrode of the voltage source to this electrode, uh, the positive electrode to that plate, right? How do I get a minus charge? It's because I missed the sign. So just you flip the sign and you get the right charge, okay? So the physics should be guiding here what we are doing. Yes? For the lower plate, I'm assuming it should be the other way around. Well, it depends which is the one and the two. If I were going on the other plate, then I could check this one. In that case, the conductor would be the one. The outer uh, part will be the two. And you would have uh, N that, uh, again, D2 minus D1 equals to rho sub S. In this case, this N hat would be phi hat or Y hat. Again, you would be at phi equals zero, so your phi hat would be uh, the y hat unit vector. Okay, it has to be phi hat, right? Because the d vector points in phi hat anyway. So otherwise, you don't find the charge density. Okay, all right. Um, let me go to a very quick example on the Coulomb law, just to remind you the the basics of um, or some basics that we had uh, said back then. So here is uh, the example. Just clean up. Okay, here is the example. I have a So this is my second example. Total charge Q1 is distributed over a semicircle of radius A. So the geometry is as follows. We have the x and the y axis. This is the semicircle of radius A. And, uh, and uh, obviously this one is uh, minus a comma zero. So I have uh, uniform distribution of Q1 over the semicircle. And then I go at 2a comma zero. And I put a charge Q2. Okay. So the question is, Find Q2 over Q1 so that the electric field at the origin is zero. So I want the electric field at the origin to be zero. OK? So that's the problem. So this is a Coulomb law problem. I need to find the electric field by superposition. This is not something where you would, exp you, you, it's not a spherical or cylindrical charge distribution where you would apply Gauss's law. And also we have no idea what's the potential either. So we cannot apply Poisson or Laplace equation. There is, there is nothing there that would suggest that I have any idea about uh, the boundary values of V. So I need to uh, apply the Coulomb law. And uh, I will find the fields 
due to the charges q1 and q2. Okay? So I'll start from q2, which is the easy part. Um, the electric field that uh, q2 generates at the origin will be q2 4 pi epsilon naught r minus r prime cubed r minus r primed. This is the general Coulomb law formula. Q2 here is the unknown charge. R is the position vector of the observation point. So the position vector of the observation point is simply which one? How much is it? The observation point now is at the origin. So it is 0. So in this formula, R is the position vector of observation point. And that is simply 0. The observation point is at the origin. R prime is the position vector of the charge. The position vector of the source. So the position vector of uh, this second charge, again, I'm starting from Q2, not Q1, because it's a bit easier, so I can do it quickly. This is the position vector of the charge Q2. Position vectors connect the origin to the source points. And uh, you see that this R prime is equal to 2A x hat. I don't put x prime hat or x hat prime. When you have Cartesian unit vectors, you don't need to prime them. x hat, y hat, z hat in every point in space are constant. Okay, so therefore there is nothing to worry about when you have Cartesian unit vectors. 2a x hat, and that means that r minus r hat will be minus 2a x hat, uh, and uh, the magnitude of this will be. 2a. The length of this vector is 2a. So I have everything I need to put together the electric field. So the electric field will be q2 by 4 pi epsilon naught 2a cubed r minus r prime, which is minus 2a x hat. So this will be um, 8 and 2 will give me 4. There will be a factor of 16 in the denominator. A and A will cancel out. A squared, x hat, and a minus sign that survives. So it is this minus sign. So that's the field. Now I go to Q1. I should add here the word uniformly distributed. So since I am uniformly distributing Q1 over the arc, there is a line charge density there, rho sub L. So it's uniformly distributed. So rho sub L on this arc, which starts at uh, phi equals pi over 2 and goes to 3 pi over 2, is equal to Q1 divided by the length of the arc. So if it was a full circle, it would be 2 pi A. Now it is a half circle, it's pi A. So that is the charge density. And now clearly I have to do superposition. So I have to imagine that this uh, charge density consists of point charges, dq, like this one, that are defined by their position vector r primed. And they are generating a field that is given by Coulomb's law at the origin. So 
In these cases, you remember that we presented a few steps. The first step is figure out which coordinate system to use. Uh, here we have part of a circle, so we have to use cylindrical coordinates. So whenever I see semicircle, circle, arc, whatever, I will need to use cylindrical coordinates. Uh, second step, I need to find dq. Here I have a line charge density. A line charge density is dq over dl. So dq is rho l times the length element. So rho l is q1 by pi a. And the length element in cylindrical coordinates will have to correspond to a differential arc length here on which this charge is distributed. Again, if you go and uh, check the differential length elements in cylindrical coordinates, you will find dr, you will find r d phi, you will find dz. Okay? So here I am on the xy plane, so my z is fixed. All these points have z equal zero, so this cannot be dz. I'm moving on a semicircle, so r is fixed, and therefore this cannot be dr. So it can only be r d phi, which makes sense because if you imagine what we are doing here, is that we have this dq and we slide it along the arc and we calculate the field for each position of dq and then by integration we add them up. So it is r d phi. However, this r, again, since I am on the circle, is equal to a for all the points. So this will be a d phi. And since uh, I am talking about sources, that will be d phi primed. OK? So I selected this one. Then the next thing to realize is that you are in a circle of radius a. So r is not arbitrary. It is a. It won't be integrated. Again, remember what superposition means, that you are breaking down the distribution into differentially small dqs, point charges, and then you go along the distribution and you calculate the electric field dq by dq. And then you add them all up. And when you add up differential quantities, that addition means integration. So this is my dq. The position vector of this, again, eight sheet, the position vector in cylindrical coordinates, r primed, r hat primed, plus z primed, z hat, not primed. There is no need to prime this one. Cartesian unit vector doesn't change in space. However, again, I'm on the z equal 0 plane. So z prime is 0. I'm on the plane. So this is the z equal 0 plane. So z prime is 0 for all these points. r prime is fixed again. It's the distance from the origin. So it is a. So I have a r hat primed. So now I see this red flag that I have a non-Cartesian primed unit vector. So I need to express it as a function of Cartesian unit vectors. So this is uh, the red flag. And I will do that uh, immediately. So I have this a r primed. And a r primed will be a x cosine phi prime plus y sine phi prime. So this is it. So r minus r primed 
is equal to 0 minus So this is r minus r prime. And the magnitude of this vector, as you would expect, because this is basically the distance from the source from the q to the origin. So the length of this vector is basically the radius of the circle, of the semicircle. So a squared cosine phi squared plus a squared sine phi squared gives you a squared over a square root is a. So this will be A. So you can do it uh, like this. A cosine phi squared plus A sine phi squared. So that will give you A. So now I have everything that I need to apply Coulomb's law for this uh, DQ. Uh, so the, that dq will produce a de, which is rho l q1 by pi a, dl, uh, which is uh, the a d phi primed. Let me put it in a different color. 4 pi epsilon naught. r minus r primed cubed. So this is A cubed. So A and A cubed will give you A squared. As you expect, that this will be an inverse uh, square distance um, field. Uh, times the vector R minus R prime, which is minus A cosine phi primed uh, minus A sine phi primed. So this is, uh, sorry, that I missed the vectors, x hat, y hat, OK? So this is it. As you see, this uh, distance vector from here to here points in the minus x minus y direction. So that's something you expect. So now what do I need to do? I need to integrate with respect to phi prime. So you see, if I had not replaced the r hat prime unit vector, most people would actually, at the integration stage that we are now at, would take it out of the integral, thinking that it's a unit vector, therefore it's a constant. But as you see, it's not a constant. As I am moving along this arc, the r hat unit vector here starts in this direction, then goes this direction, this direction, this direction, this direction. So it changes to follow this, um, the position of the dq. So that's why I have to keep track of this, do this replacement, and now I can integrate. That is the last step in this process. In fact, uh, this is due to the first, I called it uh, E1. So DE1 will be the integral of this over the entire arc. Let me do some, uh, uh, eliminate some of the uh, constants. So I will have a minus sign. A times A squared by A cubed will give me uh, an, an A. And there is another A here. In fact, these this A's will cancel out. Uh, so I have a over a cubed a squared in the denominator, 4 pi epsilon naught a squared, uh, q1, and then a pi squared from pi and pi. And now I have the integrals. Pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2. So be careful. Now I have this semicircle. It starts at pi over 2 and goes to 3 pi over 2, the first integral is cosine phi primed. And the second one is sine phi primed.
Okay, so this is my uh, electric field. It has these two components potentially. So I do these uh, integrals separately, cosine phi primed, d phi primed, from pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2. The integral of sine phi prime is cosine phi prime is sine phi prime, so this will be sine phi from 90 to, to 70. So sine of 3 pi over 2 minus sine of pi over 2, that will give me minus 1, minus 1, it's minus 2. So there is another minus sign there. The second integral is minus cosine phi from pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2. That will give me actually 0 because the cosine is 0 both at 270 degrees and 90 degrees. So this will be 0 minus 0. It is something that I would have expected already from the geometry. So potentially, I don't even need to run this integration, this second integration, because I have this arc. So a dq down here will give you an electric field like this. And there is always this uh, symmetrically placed dq prime that will give you another electric field like this. So you see those two added up will give you a total electric field along the axis. And that's exactly what the integral tells you, that this term here will be 0. And the only term that you will have is the one from the cosine phi that will give you this uh, minus 2. So all in all now, I have found the first electric field, or the electric field due to the first charge distribution. All I need to do is uh, transfer the result from the left board here. That will be, I have a minus and another minus. Uh, so it is in the x hat direction as well, just like the first field. And it is uh, 2q1, 2q1 by uh, 4 pi squared epsilon naught a squared. OK, so this is the result. And the question asks, find the ratio of q1 and q2 so that uh, the two cancel each other out. In fact, uh, I apologize, I just uh, erased the E2, but I can see it here and rewrite it. I thought it was this one, but it is actually down here. So that was also in the x direction, in fact, the minus x direction, q2 by 16 pi epsilon naught a squared. So I need these two to add up to 0. That means that I need 2q1 by 4 pi squared epsilon naught a squared um, minus q2 by 16 pi epsilon naught a squared to be equal to 0. Uh, a bunch of cancellations, the a squares, the epsilon naughts. Uh, pi partially cancels. And uh, this gives me a 2. So q1 over 2 will be q2 over, or 2 pi, q2 over 16. So q2 will have to be 8 q1 over pi. So in this case, I get 0 force. I get 0 force at the origin. So of course, the last part is not as important as the first and the second part uh, where we apply uh, the Coulomb law. Yes. I, uh, well, I had to break this down to a line charge density so that I apply Coulomb's law point charge by point charge. So that's why the question was, I guess if I understand correctly, why I broke the Q1 down to a line charge density. Is that your question? Yeah, because I have no other way to uh, basically calculate the field other than breaking it down to point charge by point charge 
on as a line charge distribution and then apply Coulomb's law for that. Yes. Also, like uh, you have divided Q1 with pi and a, right? Yeah. That's something we normally get when we are integrating two sides, right? From, uh, but there is no reason for integration. Like we shouldn't have, um, you know, obsession with mathematics. Here you have Q1 over a semicircle. So why should I integrate anything? It's Q1 by pi a. It's as simple as that. I think your classmate has a question. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so can you explain how you got from DL to 85? How I got from? DL to 85. Right. So the question is how I got from DL here to 85. First of all, if we want to see this intuitively, DL is an arc length on the uh, semicircle. Okay. So how do you get this arc length? You start from this point, you change your angle by d phi, and you go to this point. Okay? So this angle here is d phi. This radius is a because you are on the circle, and therefore this will be the arc length, a d phi. Okay? Second way, if you have no idea about all this, you go to the H sheet, you are looking at differential length elements. In cylindrical coordinates that we're using here, you see these are the, two, the three candidates. So dr cannot be because I'm on the circle. So r is fixed, dr is 0. dz cannot be because I am on the z equal 0 plane, dz is 0. So the only one that it can be is r d phi. And r, since I'm on the circle, cannot be an open variable. It is actually equal to the radius of the circle. Okay. All right, thank you very much. I, I have not run out of examples, so I'll continue tomorrow.